Hello and welcome back to Season 1, covering Unit 1 of WJEC GECSC Biology. It would help me if I could spell. And we're looking at Unit 1 Biology. This is going to be Episode 2. I envisage this being three videos. And we're going to be covering 1.2 Respiration and the Respiratory System in Humans. And this video in particular, these are, this here is listing all of the statements from the specification that you guys need to know. And in particular, we're going to be covering just A and B with this video. We'll see how much time that takes. We could go on, but I think I'd rather keep the, the videos quite short. We're going to be looking at aerobic respiration, which is the stepwise breakdown of sugar, of glucose, to release the energy using oxygen. And with no oxygen present, we perform something called anaerobic respiration, which gives you a, just a small amount of energy just to keep the, the cell ticking over in, in needs of emergency, I guess. So we're going to look at these two different processes. So here you can see the equation for respiration. So we've got glucose plus oxygen, and these react together to give you carbon dioxide plus water. Now the first thing I should point out that this equation is really a summary of what goes on. I mean there are many many reactions each of which is controlled by a specific enzyme but the breakdown of glucose which starts in the cytoplasm of the cell I mean that's 10 separate reactions to start with and then the, the, the final product from that series of reactions pyruvate goes inside the mitochondria where we get another series of reactions that go on and it just gets further and further broken down. But ultimately, we must have glucose, we must have oxygen, and carbon dioxide and water are produced. Okay, So the reason I put those colours in there, just to make the point really, that glucose, so we're going to get that from our digested food, that will enter the bloodstream via the small intestine, we mentioned that in the last series of videos, and it gets circulated to all cells by the blood. We really have such a a good circulatory system which will be dealt with later on in the course. Uh, the oxygen diffuses from the atmosphere into the blood across that concentration gradient we talked about via the alveoli, more of these later and what makes them so good at absorbing and allowing for, for gas exchange, not just absorbing oxygen but excreting carbon dioxide as well. And again circulated via red blood cells and haemoglobin in particular within those red blood cells transporting them and dropping off to the places where they're required for respiration to take place. Now the products of respiration, carbon dioxide, will diffuse out of the cells into the blood, where it's going to eventually be excreted via the lungs. So it's in a higher concentration in the blood than is, in, is inside the lungs, so it gets excreted out by diffusion. And the water itself, I mean the water is going to be used wherever possible to Obviously, within the cell, between cells, you know, plasma of the blood. But if there is excess, then that's obviously going to be excreted out, and that's controlled by your kidneys uh, within the urinary system. Now, the reason why glucose is broken down in this series of reactions, as it is, is to obtain energy. And if you ever want to see the amount of energy in glucose, there's an experiment you should ask your teachers to do. And some schools don't like this experiment. It was banned for a long time. And you'll probably see why if you ever see the experiment. Because it releases the energy from a single jelly baby very, very quickly indeed. And it's very impressive and it's a wonderful experiment to see. And it really shows just how much energy there is inside a jelly baby, inside sugar. Okay? So... It's that energy that we want to get hold of. But if all of that energy was released at once, as is when in the case of the experiment with the screaming jelly baby, then most of that energy would be lost. I mean, we, we lose energy anyway when we, when we break down glucose. But normally, it's a much smaller amount because we break down glucose in a series of steps. As I said, 10 steps just in the cytoplasm before we enter the mitochondria where the majority of the reactions happen. If we're going to investigate to see if respiration is going on, there's an experiment 
that we normally do, which would involve using flasks with germinating peas or beans or some sort of similar legume. And we get these guys respiring in a flask, a thermos flask normally, something like that. I'm not going to draw all of those. We simply put a thermometer into there. We have it nice and sealed. Okay, and we measure the temperature. And the fact that the temperature goes up demonstrates very que clearly that uh, the energy is being released. Now, how do we know that won't get hotter anyway on its own? Well, of course, we'll set up a control. And in the control, oh gosh, my drawings are dreadful. <laughs> in the control, we would have the same substances. We'd have the same beans or the same peas. But this time, we would boil them to hopefully denature the enzymes and kill them. And then we'd put some disinfectant in there. And the disinfectant would kill any bacteria to make sure they're not respiring as well. And what I would expect to see is that the temperature in this one would stay the same. Because there's no respiration going on, I would expect to see that temperature stay the same. So the fact that this one goes up, the temperature goes up, demonstrates that respiration is going on and that it's releasing that energy. So I've just copied this diagram and put it there because that was just too embarrassing. Still a pretty bad drawing, but hopefully slightly more clearer. Um, so again, we've got some respiring mung beans or some peas on the go. And so those guys are in there. If we boil them to kill the enzymes, to denature the enzymes, put disinfectant in there to stop any bacteria from respiring, I would expect this, our control, to stay the same temperature. I would expect this one's temperature to go up because these guys are respiring and some of that energy is being lost as heat. Now, we certainly don't want that to happen. We want is the energy from the breakdown of glucose and respiration to be captured in the form of ATP. Okay, and that stands for adenosine triphosphate. Okay, this is higher tier stuff, but as I said before, I think we should all cover it because who knows what final T you're going to do. I'm trying to draw it now. Phosphate, phosphate, phosphate. There's three of them. So it's triphosphate. That's our ribose. And that's adenine. So all of that together is adenosine triphosphate. And the energy, the secret is in the bonds. So we've got this high energy bond. Between the second and third phosphate. And that's where the energy is. So when you release that small amount of energy from glucose. At each, each time there's a reaction. Not every reaction. But building up to. Every time there's a little release of energy. It goes to change adenosine diphosphate. So where there's two phosphates, we take a phosphate and we make a TP, which has got three phosphates. And it's got this high energy bond. Now that ATP can move around within the cell, for example. And if you need that energy now to move something into the cell through active transport, you're going to release that phosphate, break this bond, and that energy is going to be available. If you're taking smaller molecules to make bigger molecules and you need energy to do that, then you're going to again break up ATP to ADP and that energy is going to be available um, for that reaction to happen. Okay, so that energy rather than being labeled in this way, which is what you'll probably see in a lot of textbooks and stuff, um, really think about that energy being sort of trickled out and captured in the form of ATP. Okay, and as I said, that is higher tier stuff, but I do think it is all of us 
worth knowing because it really helps us understand exactly what happens. Now we know it doesn't capture all the energy because in this experiment, which you'll probably do, um, some of that energy gets lost as heat. Now, if, if with warm-blooded animals, obviously that's a good thing because that keeps us at the right temperature. That keeps us at, at 33 degrees, 33, 37 degrees, which is uh, the, the temperature that our enzymes work best at. Okay, so the, the fact that our energy is lost as heat doesn't really matter too much. Okay, now with aerobic respiration, so we've got plenty of oxygen about, flooding the cells and able to carry out all these reactions, we get something like 38 molecules of ATP for the breakdown of each glucose molecule. Okay, now if there's no oxygen available, so if you're exercising at a rate that is causing your cells to respire faster, to use up that oxygen faster than your body can supply it, then this is going to slow down and eventually stop. Okay, so aerobic respiration, if we take oxygen out of the equation, if that's gone, then this all stops. Okay, now that's going to be pretty bad news for the cell, because that means that cell is going to basically stop working. It's not going to have ATP to be able to do all the things that it needs to do. It's not going to have that energy. But that's not the quite the end, because our cells are capable of carrying out anaerobic respiration. And what happens there, if there's no oxygen around, glucose is incompletely broken down, but it is broken down to form lactic acid. Okay, now we mentioned ATP, 38 from aerobic respiration, anaerobic, we only get about 2 ATP. And it's for this reason that we describe anaerobic respiration as being less efficient, because we're getting less energy from the breakdown of glucose when compared with aerobic respiration. Okay, This lactic acid, this product of anaerobic respiration is actually harmful to the body and it must be removed and broken down as quickly as possible. The way we do that is to oxidize it um, into carbon dioxide plus water as quickly as possible. Okay, so this is why after you finish exercising, you continue to breathe deeply and more rapidly because you're taking in extra oxygen and that extra oxygen is used to break down lactic acid. And because we're taking in that extra oxygen, we call that the oxygen debt. So you've got to pay back kind of what you've borrowed in order to keep exercising even when there wasn't enough oxygen around. Okay. So... Just looking back very quickly, to finish, just to double check, we've covered what we should have from the specification here. Aerobic respiration is a process that occurs in cells when oxygen is available. It's a series of enzyme controlled reactions uh, that uses glucose and oxygen to release the energy from, from glucose and produce carbon dioxide and water. That energy is released in the form of ATP and you need to be able to state the word equation as, as shown there. Now anaerobic respiration only occurs in the absence of oxygen. Glucose is broken down to release energy, a small amount of energy, and lactic acid. Oxygen debt, we need extra oxygen to actually break down that lactic acid. It's a less efficient process. Less ATP is produced. And again, you need to be able to state the word equation for anaerobic respiration.